in the early ages of the world, according to the scripture chronology, there were no kings, the consequence of which was there were no wars. It is the pride of kings which throw mankind into confusion. Antiquity favors the same remark. For the quiet and rural lives of the first patriarchs hath a happy something in them, which vanishes away when we come to the history of Jewish royalty. Government by kings was first introduced into the world by the heathens, from whom the children of Israel copied the custom. It was the most prosperous invention the devil ever set on foot for the promotion of idolatry. The heathens paid divine honors to their deceased kings, and the Christian world hath improved on that plan by doing the same to their living ones. How impious is the title of sacred majesty applied to a worm who in the midst of his splendor is crumbling into dust. As the exalting one man so greatly above the rest cannot be justified on equal rights of nature, so neither can it be defended on the authority of Scripture. For the will of the Almighty, as declared by Gideon and the prophet Samuel, expressly disapproves of government by kings. All anti-monarchical parts of Scripture have been very smoothly glossed over in monarchical governments, but they undoubtedly merit the attention of countries which have their governments yet to form. Render unto Caesar things which are Caesar's is the scriptural doctrine of the courts, yet it is no support of monarchical government, for the Jews at that time were without a king and in a state of vassalage subjection to the Romans. And near 3,000 years passed away from the Mosaic account of the creation till the Jews, under a national delusion, requested a king. Till then, their form of government, except in extraordinary cases where the Almighty interposed, was a kind of republic administered by a judge and the elders of the tribes. Kings they had none, and it was held sinful to acknowledge any being under that title but the Lord of hosts. And when a man seriously reflects on the idolatrous homage which is paid to the persons of kings, he need not wonder that the Almighty, ever jealous of his honor, should disapprove of a form of government which so impiously invades the prerogative of heaven. Monarchy is ranked in scripture as one of the sins of the Jews, for which a curse and reserve is denounced against them. The history of that transaction is worth attending to. The children of Israel being oppressed by the Midianites, Gideon marched against them with a small army, and victory, through the divine interposition, decided in his favor. The Jews, elate with success and attributing it, to the generalship of Gideon, proposed making him a king, saying, Rule thou over us, thou and thy son and thy son's son. Here was temptation in its fullest extent, not a kingdom only, but a hereditary one. But Gideon, in the piety of his soul, replied, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you, the Lord shall rule over you. Words need not be more explicit. Gideon doth not decline the honor, but denieth their right to give it. Neither doth he compliment them with invented declarations of his thanks, but in the positive style of a prophet, charges them with disaffection to their proper sovereign, the King of Heaven. About 130 years after this, they fell again into the same error. The hankering which the Jews had for the idolatrous customs of the heathens is something exceedingly unaccountable. But so it was that laying hold of the misconduct of Samuel's two sons, who were entrusted with some secular concerns, they came in an abrupt and clamorous manner to Samuel, saying, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. And here we cannot but observe their motives for bad, namely that they might be like unto other nations, that is, the heathens, 
whereas their true glory laid in being as much unlike them as possible. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me. Then I should not reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This shall be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself for his chariots and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. This description agrees with the present mode of impressing men. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots, and he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. This describes the expense and luxury as well as the oppression of kings. And he will take your fields and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give them to his officers and to his servants, by which we see that bribery corruption and favoritism are standing vices of kings and he will take the tenth of your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work and he will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants and ye shall cry out in that day because of your king which ye shall have chosen and the Lord will not hear you in that day. This accounts for the continuation of monarchy. Neither do the characters of the few good kings which have lived since either sanctify the title or bolt out the sinfulness of the origin. The high encomium praise given to David takes no notice of him officially as a king, but only as a man after God's own heart. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we may be like all other nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel continued to reason with them, but to no purpose. He set before them their ingratitude, but all would not avail. And seeing them fully bent on their folly, he cried out, I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, which then was a punishment, being the time of the wheat harvest, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking you a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto our sins this evil, to ask a king. These portions of scripture are direct and positive. They admit of no equivocal construction that the Almighty hath here entered his protest against monarchical government is true or the scripture is false.